and the whole world opened up on the commentary front. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's been great fun. I've been very lucky. Yeah, and more than that, I mean, those of us back home also know that he has, you know, a cult status back in India as well. So, Tony, where do you call home? I mean, uh, on and off the field in that sense, as far as cricket grounds are concerned, is there one that you really feel like? Well, I mean, home for me is, has basically been cricket. Yeah. You know, I go where the cricket is, really. Um, but my home physically is in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. I, I love Sydney. I love Australia. And um, that's where I've ended up. And I've been there since 1978. So, um, you know, when it comes to catching a plane and heading home, that's where I go. That's where your family is, yeah. That's right. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting in this day and age when we've got, um, you know, such an incredible um, change in the way we, we watch and listen and, uh, and track things in cricket. Uh, you're almost everywhere all the time. I mean, it's, uh, with the internet the way it is at the moment, uh, you, you shouldn't be missing out on anything. Uh, with the way television is, especially uh, the multiple channels that we see, uh, and radio, of course, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a wonderful time to be a cricket lover. Now, you know, Tony, you're known for someone who kind of is always in the face of wanting to see new things. And, of course, one of the biggest associations with you is World Series Cricket and Kerry Pracker. Now, that also happened at a very interesting time in your career. So tell us a little more about that association. Yeah, well, World Series Cricket and Kerry Packer um, came about as a result um, in the first instance of Kerry Packer wanting to get cricket on his television station. And um, we know all about that because in India um, and in, in this part of the world, uh, Asia generally, uh, that's top priority for any television station mm -hmm. because cricket is so popular. Um, but it became clear in Australia that um, the ratings for cricket, because it was the one sport that they played everywhere across uh, the country, was important. It was important to get it on commercial television and uh, important to get it exclusively as well. And uh, it was a very interesting time because at that time the BBC in the UK had cricket uh, and the ABC, the, the more conservative non-commercial stations were perceived to be the ones that should cover the game. People couldn't get their heads around the fact that there should be a commercial in a cricket match. And that, that was very strange because really cricket is the perfect game for a commercial because there is this pause between overs. Yeah. <clears throat> so Kerry P Packer saw this. Uh, he went and made an offer for cricket, and um, the board knocked him back. He offered more money than uh, they, uh, they thought they'd ever get, but they still knocked him back because they were worried about the way commercialisation of cricket would go. And um, as a result of that, he decided, right, oh, well, I've got to go and get my own cricketers because they won't let me in. And we, of course, at the time, were being badly abused in terms of payments. Um, the grounds across England were full, um, certainly in places like India and other places, still packed houses, and we were getting paid a, an absolute pittance. So it wasn't hard for Kerry Packer to come to someone like me and say, uh, look, uh, can you pull together the 16 best creators in the world? And I did. <clears throat> Excuse me, it took me five minutes, really, to jump on an aeroplane, to go to the West Indies, and uh, to go around the world, Make pick up the best players in the world. And that, that was how it started. And, uh, of course, there was a compromise soon after that because I think people realised uh, once the lights went up, we started playing in coloured clothing, that there was more to cricket than yeah. uh, simply, you know, uh, a red ball and white clothing. Tony, if anything, from a fan's point of view, it's a lot of fun to see our cricketers fit into that role. Uh, anyway, more with Tony Gregg on the other side, so make sure you stay with us. Welcome back, still in conversation with Tony Gregg, and now it's time to get a little personal. Mm. Now, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about, first of all, you played against a West Indies side, which ended up being a merging force under Clive Lloyd. You played against them. Your memories of that? Or, um, I suppose my lasting memories are pace, pace and more pace. So, <laughs> that's probably uh, the best way to sum up that West Indian cricket team. They also had um, some wonderful flair in terms of their batting. Um, you know, I, I, I'll just never forget my tours to the Caribbean. And um, I will never be allowed to forget um, the Caribbean tours to England because that's when, when I uh, told them in no uncertain terms that uh, we were going to beat them. And I used the word grovel, yeah. which was a very silly thing to do at the time. And, of course, they made me pay for that uh, big time. But uh, that Clive Lloyd was a, was a fantastic uh, leader of West Indian men. Um, if you speak to any of the players that played underneath him, he was a sort of uh, a very much a fatherly figure. I don't necessarily think that he was the greatest tactician of all mm -hmm. time, but uh, I don't want to detract in any way from his contribution because, you know, basically he had such fantastic cricketers 
uh, around him. In retrospect, I mean, if you go back to the statement you used, uh, was it A, was it misinterpreted? And do you regret make, using a word like uh, grovel? And we, did you actually get quite a lashing by your father? I mean, we believe that he gave oh, you quite a lashing. Oh, my dad gave me heaps. Yeah. Now, oh, look, uh, these things happen. If you, if you uh, are in front of the camera a lot, uh, especially on sort of off-the-cuff uh, live clips that are taken, you know, wherever you are, there are going to be occasions, um, unless you're very, very good, um, where you're going to now and again be caught short. Mm -hmm. And I was caught short. I used a really bad word. I mean, basically, it, it, what happened was I'd seen the West Indies beaten 5-1 by Australia. And I really was upset that the English press were putting them up on a pedestal the way they were, and they weren't getting behind us. And so, you know, I said to this guy, you know, if we can beat them in the first test match, you know, this West Indian side sort of lose it if they get beaten. And uh, instead of going down that course and saying, you know, they'll lose it, you know, if we can get on top of them. I used the word, we'll make them grovel. And I mean, I've regretted it ever since. It was a very silly word to use, especially with my South African background at mm. the time. And you can imagine the reaction of, um, sure. of the West Indians in England in particular. I've got to say that it did give the series serious momentum yeah. <laughs> because they got stuck in. And every time that I went to the crease, um, my colleague down the other end would say, before you came out here, things were nice and peaceful. As soon as you arrived, they got quicker and quicker and quicker <laughs> and nastier, but um, but you did mistake. you did stand your ground <clears throat> though, Tony. I mean, you try, you you did have quite a few noteworthy contributions. Is that so? Oh, How did you series. actually withstand the pressure with all the surrounding atmosphere and what things people were saying? That's what it's about at the end of the day. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, for me and you know any youngster that's watching this, I mean, it's one thing you know being a natural and being able to play this game naturally. It's it seems to me more important to have a good temperament. And um, I think that I was brought up in an environment where I developed a good temperament. Um, as a youngster, I, um, I went over the edge of a cliff in a, in a, in a truck um, as a 12-year-old, and I, I um, got some left temporal scarring, mm -hmm. became an epileptic, and I've had to take tablets ever since. And I think, you know, getting over that hurdle, um, playing my sport at, uh, with uh, cousins who never gave anything, giving me a hard time, a lot of Mickey taking amongst the, the family, you know, I think that I was prepared when I got into the big time. I had a good temperament, and so that certainly helped me when the chips were down. And, um, yes, I, I, I played pretty well in that series. I mean, speaking, just taking from what you said, temperament is so important in a game of cricket. When I got into, you got involved with cricket, people always told me it's talent and temperament, and the Aussies under Steve Waugh certainly had that aura. And a lot of people have compared it to that West Indian side that you uh, played with. Do you also draw some similar comparisons? Yes, I, th I think there's definitely some, some uh, very good comparisons there. Steve Waugh is a good example of a wonderful temperament. I mean, you know, he wasn't considered to be a great captain either, but um, when the chips were down, Steve Waugh with a bat in his hand was very difficult to get out. Um, he also believed, I mean, there's a belief in himself as well. I mean, he's, there, there, there are a lot of positives in Steve Waugh's game. And um, the West Indian game... <coughs> Far more flary. I mean, they played a brand of cricket that, if it came off, it, it, they were impossible to beat. I mean, Viv Richards, you know, in his pomp, when he really went, he was very, very difficult to handle. But they also gave you a chance because of the nature of the way they played. The, the nearest comparison to the way they played for me was in the modern game, Verinda Sawag. I mean, Sawag, you know, can take you for a 300, in which case you're going to get cleaned up. For the Australians, do you feel that that era of dominance is coming to an end? And I ask this why, because, I mean, we, we know a lot of clashes that have happened with Australia and India as well on the field, and we tend to say that the Indian cricketers are getting more aggressive. So do you feel that South Africa and India are really threatening that era of dominance that Australia have? Well, yes, yes and no. I mean, um, don't underestimate Australia and where they can go to from here because they can bounce back just as fast as they slip. You know, they, they, ha they have a fantastic system in Australia. Um, I think... The emergence of South Africa is a bit of a force. Uh, as a, I mean, it's a real credit to them that they've been able to do this um, through these incredible changes that they've gone through in South Africa. It's a credit to everybody down there because it's not been easy. And we're seeing some great young players now like young Dumini, who's gone through all his schooling um, under this new regime, you know, since the, in the post-apartheid period. So um, a tick for them. South Africa have always been aggressive. They have, I mean, going back to... You know, when I was a young kid, South African cricket has always been aggressive. And perhaps get it from their rugby, I'm not too sure. Um, Australians have always been aggressive. I think in the Asian countries, Pakistan under Imran Khan 
were very aggressive and it seems to me that they were always a bit more aggressive than the Indians. India, I think, took their cue from Arjuna Ranatunga. Arjuna, for me, was, uh, and, and the Sri Lankans were very similar to the Indians. Arjuna took that stance against Australia and won a, a, a seriously good battle against them. And I'm seeing now, certainly under Dhoni, that same attitude. And not just towards the opposition. I mean, Dhoni doesn't take any nonsense from anybody. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very refreshing. It's good for cricket too, because what it does, it creates those, uh, you know, you're talking about um, some of these clashes. Those clashes are good for cricket. It's good for the fans. We enjoy uh, it, yeah. Absolutely. And, and the papers and all those, you know, those news shows that you see across India. I mean, something happens these days, like the, you know, the Simons Habajan thing. Mm. I mean, all of a sudden it's front page. And for me, it's good for the game. I mean, you know, part of yeah. this game is about having things like that happen. Now, a role of a captain when things like this happen, be, uh, you know, having been a captain, how do you rate Dhoni in the fact that how has he dealt with none, not his controversies, but his teammates' controversies, you know, with the fact that they're challenging for that number one spot in the world, having won a T20 World Cup as well. Has he also, uh, I mean, how does he generate himself as a player and a captain? T20 World Cup win, I mean, that can happen, you know, uh, I, you know I'd, I'd, I wouldn't want to place too much importance on that, but I, I've got to say that I think that he's handling himself brilliantly. Uh, it doesn't seem to me to be affecting his game. He uh, is an aggressive, attacking batsman. Um, I like the way he handles, especially the senior players in his team. It seems to me that for the first time for a while, we've got a captain of India who, it doesn't matter whether it's Tendulkar, Dravid, Kumble, any of the senior players, he treats everyone the same and uh, I, I like that attitude. I think that's the way you should be as a captain. He's prepared to bring the youngsters in, gambles on the youngsters, gives them their head. At the same time, he seems nice and relaxed and calm. But you know, we haven't even talked about the master blaster, the idol that everyone lo loves back home, Sachin Tendulkar. Look, I think he is. Um, from, a, from a young kid's point of view, I think you need someone like that. Uh, there, there have been a few of them around uh, in this recent generation of cricketers. I mean, Adam Gilchrist's another one. I think he's one of those players that's been ahead of his time in so much as, you know, he, he actually walks when he's out. And I like that because I think, you know, people that, um, that take a bit of an initiative in that regard, especially at this time when we've got uh, all these cameras, um, you know, proving that some people are actually cheating. Um, I like that sort, of, um, that sort of attitude. I think it's, it's very refreshing. Um, as far as Sachin's role model role is concerned, I mean, it just comes so naturally to him. I mean, he's well behaved. Uh, he accepts the umpire's decision, no matter what it is. Um, he doesn't get involved in too much controversy. When he says something, people tend to listen because they respect him. I do, however, believe that in any team, you, while you need a Sachin Tendulkar, you don't want everyone to be like that because then, you know, it becomes, you know, for me, too much of the, of the, of the same sort of thing. Uh, you need a Habajan Singh there. You need a few stirrers, a few guys that are going to cause a few problems as well. And, I mean, as a result of that, you then, I think guys like, uh, like Sachin are tested even more. Um, but there's absolutely no doubt that he has been a fantastic uh, example to young cricketers. All right, great, Tony. We've got many more opinions from Tony Gred coming up, but we'll uh, go for another quick break before that. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're still in conversation with the legendary Tony Gregg, who's uh, overcome a lot of difficulties uh, when it comes to cricket, more specifically epilepsy. Uh, you had your mm. first fit when you were 14. Now, how tough was it tackling that? And before I ask you that, I, mm. I believe you also played tennis and rugby, but made the choice of cricket because it was e easier to tackle epilepsy with that. Um, re yes and no. I mean, you know, basically, uh, I, yeah, I played first team cricket, tennis and rugby at school, which was, uh, which was great fun. I just loved it anyhow, all of them. Um, but cricket really offered the opportunity for me and uh, it, was a, it was the game that you could make a career out of in England. So that's why I ended up playing cricket. But and, uh, epilepsy, um, it, it certainly concentrated the mind for me because basically what happened was, uh, you know, when you, when you get something like that, you worry that it's going to upset what you want to do in your life. And you've really got to address it. And I was given some great advice by um, uh, my doctor early on. Uh, just a, just a, the, he was just a GP and he said to me, look, you're going to have to learn to live with this thing one way or the other. And the only way that you're going to do that is that you're going to have to find that little something that warns you that you've got a seizure coming on. 
And so I really worked very hard to search for any warning signs. And I mean, any, anyone who's suffered from epilepsy knows that that's what you've got to do. Now, you get all the tablets, but at the end of the day, you want to take yourself out of danger. If you want to go swimming um, and um, climbing mountains and things like that, you can't place yourself in a situation where if you're vulnerable, you have a seizure and then, of course, drown mm -hmm. because then you won't get to play test cricket. So there's no future in that. So I, I work very hard on that. And my form of epilepsy is such that I do get a warning so I can take myself out of danger. So mm -hmm. that worked for me very well. It also gave me a little bit of strength of character. I mean, I, you know, when you get over things like that, um, you, you start to realise, you know, anyone who's had any form of illness realises that the, the best part uh, is when you feel well. Um, and, you know, I, I just revel in feeling well. So I work very hard at it. Another significant step for you, and at that stage would have been a huge risk, was the decision to move to England and to play cricket over there. I mean, uh, with everything going on in terms of a family thought, um, it, it, it wasn't really that hard because my, my father basically was um, a, a left-wing politician in South Africa, very close to a guy called Donald Woods who wrote that uh, Cry Freedom, which is the book about Steve Biko. And so we as a family were, we had to be just a little bit careful because we were sort of linked with uh, the left-wing groups in South Africa during the period of apartheid. Um, so my father was very keen for me to get overseas and um, start a life overseas. And if I wasn't going to do that, he wanted me to teach, and I, I actually wanted to teach history. But uh, I got lucky. I mean, you know, that's what life's about. You've, uh, you need a few breaks. And I, um, I got invited to go to Sussex for a trial. And the rest is history. I, I, went, I just loved Century on debut against I mean, Lancashire. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> it was, um, I mean, it was a wonderful experience to go and actually play cricket and get paid. Even although we didn't get paid very much, I actually think I would have done it for nothing. Hmm. And then I had this incredible experience where... Um, unbeknown to me, in my very first match playing for Sussex, there was a guy called uh, Rhodes, Dusty Rhodes, who was the umpire. And he, just after the war, had gone to South Africa and met up with my dad every night for a drink in the Barwons Grand Hotel in Queenstown. He was coaching cricket. My dad was working uh, in the town after he'd finished his, um, his stint with the Royal Air Force. And uh, all those years later, 20 years later, I walk out to bat against Lancashire and there's this bloke Dusty Rhodes as the umpire and he says to Brian Statham who'd got three wickets who's this kid and he says his name's Greg and I walked out uh, took guard and um, first ball from Statham hit me on the towers plum LBW for naught first ball and uh, everyone looked at this umpire Dusty Rhodes and uh, he just shook his head and said not out and I couldn't believe it I got a single next ball and I got down that end and he said he looked at me and he said uh, your name Greg? And I said, yeah. And he said, uh, you wouldn't by any chance be related to a guy called Sandy Greg, would you? And I said, it's my dad. He looked down the pitch and said, great decision. I got 100. I got Fantastic. 150, actually. And yeah. it then rained for two days. And so, again, I mean, that was just a break for me. It would have been decidedly more difficult to come in to the second match, having got naught first ball in the first match. And so um, that little break set me, set the ball rolling for me, and away we went. Talking about your captaincy, that 77 tour to India where uh, you got, you got a, you made a century despite having about a fever. That must have been fantastic. At Eden Gardens, which is, I know if you make it at Eden Gardens, that is it. That's oh what you've got to call status that's back home. That's a great home, space. Huh? Great, great place that is. I mean, that's my favorite career ground. That yeah. is the place that I first felt like a serious entertainer. You know, that, that old Eden Gardens, which used to literally, it used to sway when the people got excited there. Um, we'd lost under Tony Lewis at Eden Gardens, having won in Delhi the previous tour, so we went to one all and then lost in, uh, in Madras, as it was known after, after that. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that my proudest time as a captain was to win the series in India. Mm -hmm. um, partially because I loved India so much, but partially also because no England captain had won there since Jardine. So it had been a long time since England won in India. And we were also up against a fantastic side. I mean, Bishan Betty was a superb spinner. Prasanna, probably the best spinner I ever played against. Chandra was uh, just uh, unbelievable. Chandra Saker. Um, very, very different. And then, of course, they had Venkat as well as a backup. And, I mean, Eki Sanka was the best forward leg forward short leg I've ever seen 
I mean, just incredible. They had some very good catches as well. Sonny, a very good player. Fish, Fish for Nath as well. I mean, you know, very good cricketers. So it was a real challenge for us in Indian conditions, in front of um, you know those wonderful crowds in India, and to 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 go three nil up was I thought a great achievement. So let's talk about what happened at Chepak. I mean, uh, and. If for it to be a controversy at that stage because, I mean, he certainly had quite a tournament. The Indians couldn't know how to deal with John Lever. And uh, what happened then? Well, we, we had a situation uh, in the third test match where um, we were accused of cheating by using Vaseline on the ball. And uh, John Lever in particular was uh, they were pointing a finger at him. But what actually happened was quite interesting because uh, it was so hot in Madras by comparison with the other places. And, you know, those days, I don't, I don't know if you remember seeing pictures of these guys, you were probably far too young, but they used to have hair down to their shoulders. Bob Willis was down here, so was Lee. You're talking about the 70s. That's right. I wasn't born to <laughs> we know that. <laughs> well, go and have a look at some pictures. They, um, they sweated profusely and they came in at lunchtime and they said to uh, Bernie Thomas, uh, our physio, look, we, we're getting really sore eyes from the sweat. And Bernie Thomas, I mean, it didn't, what he should have done is tie their hair in a ponytail or something. But what he did is he did what marathon runners did. He said, look, wear some Vaseline down the side of your face because it'll channel the sweat down the side, as they do when they run these marathons, apparently. Well, of course, our guys were used to taking sweat from their brow, putting it on the ball, which you're perfectly entitled to do. Lever lost control of the ball. So he took all this stuff off because they, they, they had it sort of into their, they had mm -hmm. sort of impregnated in their, in their eyelashes. They put it down behind the stumps. Bishan saw this, the umpire saw this, and that's what caused the problem. There was no intention on our part to mm. cheat at all. Uh, it was an unfortunate incident, and it blew away just as fast as it arrived. All right, finally, on a light note, I mean, we've talked about your numerous accolades and your numerous roles in life, but uh, Tony Craig's a professional wine taster, and I know you love your wine, Tony. Well, I'm not a, I'm, I can assure you I'm not a professional wine taster. <laughs> but, uh, yes, I, I mean, if you live in Australia, um, and you don't want to become one of those huge, big Australians that drinks beer and more beer and more beer. The thing to do is uh, to get a little bit cultured and drink some nice wine. <laughs> and so that's, that's, that's my little uh, indulgence at the end of the day. Thank you so much for talking with Absolute us. It's been pleasure. a pleasure, it's, as always. Pleasure. All right, guys, and most importantly, thanks all of you for joining us for this interview. I hope you had a good time, and we'll hopefully see you again next time. Goodbye.